Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, where I look at the films that shaped those of us who belong to the MTV generation. Today I'm looking at a 1985 film that was made for British television and that sparked a fervent pop culture craze, Max Headroom. Max Headroom, full title Max Headroom 20 Minutes into the Future, was co-directed by Annabelle Jenkel and Rocky Morton, known at the time for creating animated music videos for artists like Elvis Costello and the Tom Tom Club. They will later become known for turning the Super Mario Bros. video game into an infamously bizarre 1993 cyberpunk dystopian cinematic bomb. The UK's Channel 4 wanted a music video show to rival MTV, so they approached Jenkel and Morton and a commercial producer named George Stone about creating some animated shorts to air between videos. Instead, they came up with the idea of creating a computer-generated VJ, a talking head in a suit whose only concept of the world came from watching thousands upon thousands of channels of television. With funding help from HBO, they made a feature film for Channel 4 to explain the genesis of that character, who became known as Max Headroom. Steve Roberts wrote a script based on ideas from Morton, Jenkel, and Stone, and the Max Headroom phenomenon was born. We open 20 minutes into the future in an unnamed city. The tallest building on the horizon is is the home of Network 23, currently the most successful of the thousands of hotly competitive television networks. Network 23's top reporter, Edison Carter, host of the What I Want to Know show, is trying to investigate a mysterious death in an apartment complex which authorities are frantically trying to sweep under the rug. Edison Carter and his alter ego Max Headroom are both played by Matt Frewer. We've seen Frewer before in a small role in Supergirl. These days he's a popular character actor in films like Watchmen and TV shows like Orphan Black, but first and foremost, until the end of his days, he's always going to be best known as Max Headroom. From his computer in the Network 23 newsroom, Edison's controller Gorister, played by Anthony Dutton, guides him through the apartment building by pulling up floor plans and hacking into security cameras. The newsroom's boss, Murray, played by Roger Sloman, gets the word from higher up that the story has been killed without explanation. Edison refuses to abandon his investigation, so Gorister cuts off contact with him and leaves him stranded. Without the protection of his controller, Edison gets attacked and beaten up by unknown miscreants. An irate Edison bursts into the control room, punches out Gorister, and demands a new controller. In the boardroom on one of the top levels of Network 23, the network president Grossman, played by Nicholas Grace, assembles his board of directors to discuss the blipvert problem. The word blipvert, referring to an extremely short and almost subliminal advertising message, was created for this film but has since passed into mainstream usage. Network 23 has recently snagged a major advertiser, the Zigzag Corporation, on the strength of their newly introduced blipverts. However, their blipverts have an unfortunate side effect and Network 23's head of research and development, a petulant and clearly sociopathic teen genius named Bryce Lynch, appears on the boardroom monitor to explain it. Bryce, played by Paul Spurrier, explains that Blipvert's work by encouraging the brain to stimulate nerve endings. In some unfortunate individuals, this causes violent, spontaneous combustion. He shows the horrified board of directors a videotape depicting the grisly effect of Blipvert's. This is what happened in the mysterious apartment death Edison was trying to investigate. Grossman is determined to keep using Blipverts despite the risk, and thus pulled him off the story. In the newsroom, Edison meets his new controller, Theora Jones, hired away from a competing network. Theora is played by Amanda Pays, also known for the 1990 TV series The Flash. Over Murray's protests, Edison and Theora immediately set about investigating why upper management killed the Blipvert story. Theora hacks into the security camera in the men's room on the executive level. Theora and Edison eavesdrop on Grossman, talking with his second-in-command, Ben Cheviot, played by Constantine Gregory, about the Blipvert problem. With Theora guiding him from the newsroom, Edison breaks into Bryce's laboratory after hours and snoops around. From his bathtub, Bryce snoops on Edison, watching him via security camera on his bathtub-mounted monitor. He uses his frog-shaped phone to call a pair of lethal and scary miscreants named Bruegel and Mahler to order them to kill Edison. Bruegel, the brains of the duo, is played by Hilton McRae, while Mahler is played by George Rossi. In Bryce's lab, Edison finds the incriminating tape of the lethal effect of Blipverts. Upon spotting Bruegel and Mahler, Theora Theora urges Edison to get out of the building. Theora tries to guide Edison to safety, but Bryce runs interference by messing with the elevators. The futuristic by way of 1985 music in Max Headroom is very good, by the way, especially in this sequence. The score was composed by Midge Ure and Chris Cross of British New Wave Darlings, Ultravox. Edison makes it to the parking garage and steals a motorcycle, with Bruegel and Mahler chasing him in their van. Bryce tries to keep the parking arm fixed in place to block his exit. Theora manages to lift it, but Bryce raises a ramp 
ramp at the last second. This sends Edison flying off his bike and into the parking arm, which notifies drivers that the maximum amount of headroom, max headroom, is 2.3 meters. By the time Theora makes it to the garage, there's no sign of Edison, apart from a bloody and smashed parking arm. Edison is alive but unconscious, and Bruegel and Mahler leave him with Bryce. As Bryce tells Grossman, Edison knows about the blipverts and thus must be permanently silenced. Bryce offers to make a computerized copy of Edison's brain to create a digital version of Edison, which will know only what Grossman and Bryce want it to know, and thus can continue to deliver news reports as usual while Edison's absence goes unnoticed. Bryce's digital copy of Edison comes to life, stuttering and glitching and deeply confused. Based on the last thing Edison saw before losing consciousness, i.e. the parking arm, it identifies itself as Max Headroom. Grossman thinks the digital copy is too deeply flawed to convincingly replace Edison, so he orders Bryce to get rid of the copy and to get rid of Edison. Bruegel and Mahler pick up a still unconscious Edison and the computer containing the digital copy. They have orders from Bryce to dump them both, but instead they sell Edison's not-quite-dead-yet body to Nightingale's Body Bank for some quick cash. They take the digital copy of Edison to a hot pink trailer, which is the mobile headquarters of a low-rent pirate network called Big Time Television, which is operated by a burned-out mohawk-wearing punk named Blank Reg and his very competent and glamorous lover Dominique. Dominique is played by Hilary Tyndall, while Blank Reg is played by well-loved character actor W. Morgan Shepard, known for his guest appearances on TV shows like Doctor Who and Star Trek and Babylon 5. Sci-fi television was a family business. Shepard, who died in 2019, was the father of Mark Shepard, who played the demon Crowley on Supernatural. Big Time Television broadcasts music videos to multitudes of drifters, who watch TVs that are placed outside in rubbish heaps in the middle of nowhere. While Bruegel and Mahler try to sell the computer-generated version of Edison to Blank Reg, they field a call from Nightingales, letting them know Edison woke up and escaped. Bruegel and Mahler hunt for Edison through empty shells of buildings that dot a bleak terrain. Edison, badly injured and confused, contacts Theora, who has stayed all night in the newsroom trying to locate him. She guides him to her lavish apartment and nurses him to health. Back at Big Time Television, Blank Reg and Dominique make Max Headroom's acquaintance. A confused Max knows he's a television host, but his thoughts are fragmented, and he can only think in terms of television and ratings. Somewhat counterintuitively, for a character who's a computer-generated version of another character, Max Headroom was made using all practical effects and not CGI. There was secrecy around the character design at the time, but Max Headroom is just Matt Frewer dressed in a suit made of fiberglass and wearing extensive prosthetics to give him more of a two-dimensional look. Blank Reg puts Max on the air, and despite Max's glitches and erratic behavior, big-time television's very low ratings begin to climb. The Network 23 boardroom explodes into chaos. They'd paused their use of blipverts to assess the danger, so ZigZag pulled their very lucrative contract, and their ratings are plunging. While investigating the meteoric rise in the ratings of the previously unknown big-time television, the board members witness Max Headroom, who has enough fragmented memories of his creation to make him very, very dangerous to Grossman. Upon discovering that Edison is alive and Max is broadcasting to the world, Grossman and Bryce, along with some Network 23 security people, hitch a ride with Bruegel and Mahler in their van to track down Edison and Max once and for all. Instead, Bruegel and Mahler casually murder the security people and clearly intend to kill Bryce and Grossman. When Bryce and Grossman try to slip away unnoticed, they're ambushed on camera by Edison and Theora. From Grossman's chair in the boardroom, Ben Cheviot gives Murray permission to air Edison's interview live. Edison grills a disgraced Grossman about how he knowingly allowed blipverts to kill viewers, and Max becomes a sensation for big-time television. Following the broadcast of this made-for-TV movie, a talk show called The Max Headroom Show aired on Channel 4 in the UK, in which Max introduced videos and interviewed celebrities. This eventually evolved into the strangely titled The Original Max Talking Headroom Show, which aired on Cinemax in the United States. For the mid-80s launch of New Coke, Coca-Cola recruited Max Headroom as its official pitchman in a massive ad campaign, centering around a series of commercials directed by Blade Runner director Ridley Scott. Max Headroom also collaborated with avant-garde electronic music act The Art of Noise on the track and video for the 1986 song Paranomia. And then in 1987, the U.S. television network ABC took that original Channel 4 film and expanded it into a series. In fact, the series pilot is pretty much a shot-for-shot -shot remake of that Channel 4 film. Matt Frewer and Amanda Pays returned as Edison and Theora, and W. Morgan Shepard returned as Blank Reg. All other roles were recast with American actors, including Arrested Development 
Simmons' Jeffrey Tambor as Murray, Saturday Night Live's Charles Rocket as Grossman, and teen star Chris Young as a vastly less sociopathic Bryce Lynch. In the mid-80s, Max was everywhere. In 1987, he was on the cover of Newsweek. In 1988, he received the highest honor that can be bestowed on any piece of pop culture, i.e. he was parodied in a porno film. And he's never really gone away. More recent appearances include an homage to Max in Eminem's 2013 Rap God video, and an appearance by Max as once again played by Matt Frewer in the 2015 film Pixels. A tribute to Max just popped up today, the day I'm filming this, in the brand new video for Bring Back the Time by New Kids on the Block. The Max Headroom universe is cyberpunk, i.e. it's a vision of a dystopian future where everything is a blend of old and new, like seeing advanced technology in a state of decay. The visual look of the film was directly inspired by two cyberpunk classics, Blade Runner and Brazil, both of which I've looked at here. The Max Headroom series is often described accurately as the first cyberpunk TV show. It still seems so weird that this series existed on American network television in 1987, slipped into ABC's primetime lineup alongside such squeaky clean sitcoms as Perfect Strangers, Who's the Boss, and Growing Pains. Because apart from being pretty weird, Max Headroom is also pretty dark and pretty cynical. It presents a scathing view of the business of television. The main villain in both the film and the TV show is television in general and Network 23 in specific. It's often joked that ABC never would have let this series on the air if anyone at the network had ever bothered to watch it. But I doubt that's the case. If we've learned anything from Max Headroom, it's that networks will put anything on the air that pulls in ratings, even if it gets those ratings by actively gnawing on the hand that feeds it. Alas, the Max Headroom series did not pull in the ratings, and it was cancelled after 14 gloriously bonkers episodes. As a character, Max Headroom is a perfect symbol of the mixed-up 80s. He's a concept that's both easy to grasp and tremendously confusing. He's a barbed satire of loud, abrasive TV pitchmen who will tell you a mixture of lies and nonsense in exchange for your attention and money. And yet at the same time, knowing all that, we were still perfectly willing to buy what he was selling. Coca-Cola shelled out a lot of money on that Max Headroom ad blitz, because even though Max is a digital cautionary tale about the dangers of believing what you see on TV, he's catchy. Everyone loves a bright, flashy, weird gimmick, and that holds true whether you're living in 1985 or 2022 or 20 minutes into the future. Next time, I'll be looking at Martin Scorsese's 1985 cult comedy, After Hours. Thank you very much for your time. I hope to see you then.